thank you so much for being here and thank you so much Mitali for taking the time and joining us and over to you. Thank you so much Amina. It's really nice to be here. Uh, so should we jump right to it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so hello everyone. It's nice to meet you virtually. Uh, I will just quickly share my slides. Can you see this? Is this visible? Yes. Okay. So I will also put my video off just to save some bandwidth. So just quickly about what we do. So uh, I am going to talk today about teacher capacity building. What it is exactly that we do under teacher capacity building. So I'm not going to talk about... Uh, our reach or I'm not going to talk about our experiences in various areas. I'm not going to talk about our experiences in tribal areas. They are many and they're important, but I'm not going to talk about them today. What I'm going to focus on today is our approach to solving a very specific problem. So this is the problem that we are we have set out to solve. It's one of the problems. Uh, I am sure you must have encountered this. Ki, I'm, a, I'm sure a lot of you must have encountered this even when you were young. Ki there are really nice teachers, nice people who genuinely care about students, who want to do well, but who can't teach. And then there are people who are struggling a little with their content. They, they, they are struggling a little with their teaching and are experiencing problems while teaching. So this is the specific problem that we are going to address today. The problem of people who really want to make a change. How do we go about it? Yeah. And uh, this is our hypothesis going forward. Is that the content and pedagogy of teachers has to be built in a systematic way. So... Uh, let me also give you a slight background of how we arrived or, or rather our uh, principles behind uh, this kind of a statement. One, we believe that teacher uh, teaching is a professional job. So just like being a doctor is a professional job, you do have to be motivated for being a doctor. You do have to have empathy, etc., etc. You also need to learn some professional skills. Our belief is that uh, to be a teacher, to be a good teacher, there also empathy is necessary, motivation is necessary, uh, all those other things are necessary, but not sufficient to do the job of teaching. We strongly believe that teaching is a professional job and how to teach is a question that can be answered professionally. Just like you can develop a sort of a curriculum for uh, a doctor, how to become a doctor, you can develop a rigorous curriculum for how to teach and most people will be able to access that curriculum. And what I mean in simple terms is that we believe that every person can learn to teach. You don't need to be born a teacher. You don't need to be, you don't need to have a natural way of uh, way with children. Every person can learn how to teach. So this is at the core of our working and so now once we accept our core belief that every person can learn to teach what we have developed at quest is essentially a framework for what learning to teach actually means so we train a lot of educators i think we have covered over 6,000 educators all over Maharashtra. We run regular fellowship programs where fellows come to our organization. They stay there for a year. Sometimes we have uh, external courses where participants come to our organization and stay for a couple of weeks and then we interact with them. And through all of this uh, different experiences of teaching teachers, 
we have come up with a framework on what it means to build the capacity of teacher what it means learning to teach so i will pause on this slide and i we will talk about four of some key components regarding teacher training today and what i'm going to do is i am going to give all of you a, a flavor of what each of this each of these components actually means so i'm not going to talk about the framework in an academic way as in i'm not going to cover the details or the explanation of each of these domains in the framework what i'm going to do is i'm going to give a sort of a example a flavor of what i mean when i say that content knowledge is a facet of capacity building what do i mean when i say that theoretical orientation is a facet of capacity building and we might not get two three and four in today's presentation but i will try uh okay so these are the four feature uh, facets of capacity building that we generally believe in content knowledge theoretical orientation pedagogic knowledge and peer practice so let me just focus on the first uh facet which is the content knowledge okay so i have a problem uh okay maybe i can get a little help here uh can someone maybe suhani or amina can you come up with a word problem for this sum can i go with it sure okay okay so four laborers are working in a field they have cultivated uh, crops okay okay so what will be what will three cultivated crop for example uh, food uh, rice and hmm. three more laborers are working together hmm. if they are cultivating together what will be the total ratio of cultivation of rice like four bags of rice if four laborers are working together in one day they are uh, cultivating four bags of rice okay. what will be the ratio of rice if three more added to three more laborers are working together you mean to say total rice cultivation right and you're yes. absolutely right so if uh, okay uh, so if i have if i cultivate four acres of rice today and three acres tomorrow what is my total cultivation something like that and this is very easy i'm sure most people can come up with even simpler problems with this now this will also most people will say ki coming up with a word problem for 8 times 2 is relatively easy for example if i say that i have eight sweets in a box and i have two such boxes how many sweets do i have overall uh now you will say ki okay what is the content knowledge in this this is easy this is something we all know so now what we are going to do is we are going to open this up Uh, and i will ask all of you to participate and instead of telling me i am going to share a mentimeter link with you i want you to type a word problem for the next problem that i'll give come up with a word problem for this the last one 1 and 3 quarters divided by half so suhani can you share the mentimeter link with people yes it's up in the chat okay so uh the way mentimeter works is just go uh, to that link and you will see a space for typing your word problem i'll pause for a minute or so and uh, please try to come up with a word problem for 1 and 3 quarters 1 and 3 fourth divided by half and try to make the word problem simple realistic so that children can understand
and I'm going to wait for a couple of minutes. Yeah, I know it's a really difficult word problem to try. And I have also given this because it's a proof of concept that what content knowledge actually means. It is nothing to do with pedagogy, but I will still encourage people to try. It, it It's okay if it's wrong and your name is not going to show up with your word problem. So you can feel free to be as wrong as possible. That is the advantage of being in an online setting that your name doesn't show up anywhere. So let me just stop my screen. Let me just... Okay, uh, some people have attempted. I will still wait for a minute and I will still encourage people to type, try to type their word problem. Talib, maybe you can also share the screen to the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just share in a couple of seconds. Okay, awesome. Okay, I think I'll share. Uh, people can still yeah okay okay so we, we have a lot of responses uh, and I understand ki one and three quarters divided by half is sort of frightening when it comes in front of you uh, okay, so I'll read some of the word problems. A baker needs to bake two cakes using one and three quarters cups of four. How can he do this? One of the ways would be to actually use an oven. So uh, just uh, the answer should be, uh, does anyone know what the answer to this question should be? It should actually be three and a half. So, uh, okay. So now I need a word problem where I have to do the operation of one and three quarters divided by half. And my answer should actually be three and a half. So now let's read the second word problem. There are two children and they want to eat four chocolates, but one fell and can't eat. So uh, now they have three, but how will they divide? Same problem. A, it is not one and three quarters divided by half. Also, the answer is not really three and a half. So I let's go to the next problem. I have only one and three fourth bars of chocolate for my two children. How can I give them equal amounts? Now, this is an excellent example. So let's say if I had eight bars of chocolate and I had to give them to my two children, what I would do? the operation that I would perform would be 8 divided by 2 and not 8 divided by half. So now if I have 1 and 3 fourth bars of chocolate for my two children, if the mathematical expression will be 1 and 3 fourth bars, 1 and 3 fourth divided by 2 and not 1 and 3 fourth divided by half. So this is an excellent example of what divided by half actually means in daily life. So a lot of us will be able to do computation. Uh, which denominators, numerators will switch, will do some uh, dividing by half is multiplying by two. But what a lot of us are struggling with here is that what that divided by half actually means in real life. I know it is multiplied by two in mathematics, but what does divided by half actually mean? Now, let me see. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I, I can't see many word problems where divided by half is something that is actually coming up. A lot of people are doing dividing by two. Or they're somehow using seven pieces for one and three quarters. Although that might be correct technically, I still need to understand if I am a child, what does one and three quarter divided by half mean in my daily life? Why should I learn it? Now I will give you an example. I will form a word problem for this. Uh, please listen carefully. 
uh, my word problem is I have one and a three quarters kg of sugar. One and three fourth kg of sugar I have. I want to make bags. I am filling bags of half a kg each. How many bags will I be able to fill? Okay. So this is my problem. I have one and three quarters of uh, one and three fourth kg of sugar. I am going to fill them in bags of half a kg. Now let's say if I fill one bag, my half a kg is done. I have one and one fourth left. If I fill the next bag, another half kg done. I have three fourths kg left. If I fill another bag, another half kg done. And now I have a quarter kg left. So if I put a quarter kg of sugar in half a kg bag, it will be filled till half. So I was able to fill one, two, three, and a half bags of sugar. So if I have one and three fourth kg of sugar, and if I start filling them in bags of half a kg each, I am able to fill three and a half bags. So that is what dividing by half actually means. Uh, is this okay? Should I go ahead? Yeah, I mean, I think if anyone has any questions or something was not clear, you can also ask. And if not, we'll just move ahead. We can wait for five seconds. Mm -hmm. If someone would like to come off mute and ask. How can we apply this in day-to-day -day problems with children facing in the classroom situations? Yes. So this is what I mean when I say so now we are coming to teacher uh, training, right? So why have I uh, come up with this problem now? Is that what a lot of teachers do is when they're, when they go and start explaining about dividing by half, multiplying by eight by three, they tend to teach rules and they don't uh, explain what dividing by half, multiplying by eight by three actually means in daily life. And one of the reasons that they might not do this is because they don't, they can't imagine themselves that what dividing by half actually means. Like a lot of us here, if I don't know what dividing by half means in daily life, I can't teach my children what dividing by half means. And what happens at the end of the day is children learn rules, but children don't uh, form concepts related to mathematics in their brains. So they can do divide by half, but they can't actually vis visualize divide by half. So this is what I mean when I say we need to build the content knowledge of teachers. So this is content knowledge of mathematics. Ki what does divide by half, multiplied by eight by three actually look like in my daily life so that I can transfer that knowledge to children. So what dividing by half here actually meant was how many times can I take out half from one and three fourth? That was essentially the uh, interpretation of division by half here. And this is what teachers need to be aware of. How many different interpretations of division can I have in my daily life? So this is an important aspect of capacity building of teachers. Building the content knowledge. Okay. Thank you so much, Mitali. Thanks, Jayashree, for that question. I think Hi, we can move. Mitali, I have a question. Yep. Yeah. So, Mitali, essentially you are saying that uh, we need to integrate the day-to-day -day applications of our life into the curriculum that is essentially maths. Yep. Uh, but uh, I, I know it's the, when the textbooks are always filled in with, say, problems and then the hard goal is to solve those problems how yeah. do you achieve this end goal say do you actually make a change in the textbooks curriculum itself or do you essentially tell the teachers to teach division in a way like you are explaining to us right yeah. now 
that's an excellent question. And if I actually go back and look at textbooks, these days, the textbooks are also filled a lot with word problems, such as the ones that I've described here. But uh, can I ask you another question, Ahana, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's say if I ask you to do a uh, quickly two and a half divided by half. I am very this... poor in maths. I'll, I'll exactly. Yeah. Math. So that is why I am asking you to just humor me. So just the way I did divide by half, can you try doing divide by half? So it is actually good if you're not. Uh... So let's say if I have two and a half kgs of rice and if I fill bags of half a kg, how many bags do you think I'll be able to fill? Oh, as in you need to divide two and a half by uh, the so number of bags that we need to fill? Now forget about uh, what do you need to do. Just uh, focus on my words. I have two and a half kgs of rice. I need to fill, if I make one bag of half a kg of rice, is my rice over or can I fill more bags? I am actually finding it difficult to answer right now. So okay. I will write my, yeah. my math is essentially poor. But so that's okay. I it's... need to write down. <laughs> no, that's okay. So I have dhai kilo rice hai na, mere paas. Hmm. And I have half a kg, half a kg, half a kg, half a kg. I have bags baan Okay. How hmm. many bags baan paongi? Dhai kilo hai. Pehle aadha kilo ka baan dha. Five, no? Five, exactly. Yeah. Easy hmm. enough? Hmm. Ha. So here, for doing two and a half divided by half, you didn't have to do the horrible calculation of two and a half is actually, what, five by two, then I do five by two divided by half, which is five by two multiplied by two, which is five. You didn't have to go there. Correct. You just mm -hmm. visualized, ki, okay, I have two and a half, dhai kilo rice hai mere paas. Aadhi kilo ke bags bharne. Kitne bhar paungi? You are actually able to imagine the problem without resorting to calculations. So calculations can be done later uh, by a calculator. Is my answer correct? What does that tell me in my day-to-day -day life? This is the skill that we want children to be equipped with. Ultimately, we have to teach them operations. Ultimately, we have to teach them the problems that are there in textbook. But how to go about teaching them is something that we can equip teachers with very well. So if I teach 1 and 3 quarters divided by half, teach kar rahi hu, to where should I start? Should I start with the rules or should I start with the concept? Now most people will say start with the concept. But if I as a teacher am unable to visualize what that concept means in daily life, how can I start with the concept? So this is what building the content knowledge means you should be able to visualize the concepts that you are teaching you should be able to have an idea of the connections can i speak concepts yeah can i speak just one more thing sorry Anna. sorry to interrupt you i think we can move with the presentation if you can put your thought in the chat ahana that would be really helpful yeah 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 sure now i think thank that you the question also yeah okay thank you so much okay. uh could i just share a thing okay so sorry i think we should move with the presentation okay. please uh, okay. use uh, the chat and then okay. we'll definitely come back to it yeah. thank you okay so this is what i mean when i say build the content knowledge okay i as a teacher should have an idea of these concepts and should have an idea of how they are related to each other or abhi isi room mein there are a lot of people who are in the education business a lot of us don't have idea about some concepts and that is completely okay. It can be built, but that is one area that we do need to focus on. Okay, now let me just start sharing my screen again. Okay, so now, so I gave you a glimpse of what content knowledge, building content knowledge actually means. Now I will give you a glimpse of, uh, of what building theoretical orientation means. Now we will go, we will jump subjects and we'll go to language. Uh, 
if I ask you the question, what is reading? Now you will, you might say, this is such a stupid question. Reading is reading. I mean, who, who, does this question even make sense? What is reading? And why do I need to even think about that? I can read. Why do I need to think about how to define reading or what is reading? So humor me for the next 10 minutes and we'll just get a glimpse of why we need to think about questions like what is reading and how it, that is relevant in classrooms and that is relevant in teacher training. So this is what I, what is the Michigan definition of reading. Now I will read the definition. Uh, the definition of reading is the process of constructing meaning through the dynamic interaction among readers' existing knowledge, the information suggested by the written language and the context of the reading situation. I will pause for five seconds so that you can process the definition. Now this does sound like a mouthful. So we are going to unpack this definition a little. So what they are saying is reading is the process of construction of meaning. So the construction of meaning lies at the center of reading and it is supported by three pillars which are prior knowledge, context of reading, and information in the text. I know that this still sounds a little bit abstract, a little bit theoretical. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to unpack the definition for you. But quickly, it is the construction of meaning which lies at the center and is supported by three pillars, prior knowledge, context of reading, and information in the text. So let's see what these mean. Okay. So can you read the following text? I am assuming most people will say no. And why not? Because most people are unfamiliar with this script. So you are not able to access the information in the text itself. Yeah, I am sure I, I assume that there'll be one or two people who might be able to read it. But still, most of us won't be able to read it. Why? Because the script is unfamiliar. And therefore, we are unable to access the information in the text itself. Access hi nahi hai. To read nahi kar, kar paayenge. Uh, I will also... Yeah. Okay. Now, can you read the following text? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I can uh, see some people saying yes, some people saying no, some people saying yes, I can read, but I can't understand. Now I will go back to the definition of reading, which is the construction of meaning. So why are we focusing on such a narrow definition of meaning? I will come to in a while. But by our definition of meaning, uh, by our definition of reading, there is no such thing as reading without meaning. What is reading? Reading is the process of construction of meaning through these three pillars, but it is the process of construction of meaning. So now I will ask the question again. Can you read the following text? Are you able to construct meaning out of it? For people who say that I can't read, uh, I can read, but I can't understand. So what we generally say is, no, we, we, I will uh, push back on the comments in the chat again, that there is no such thing as I can read it, but I can't understand it. Reading implies understanding by the definition that we have seen. So by our definition, and I will give you a very clear reasoning of why I am sticking to this definition, but by our definition, can you understand what is happening? If you can't, then you can't read it. And I will go quickly again. So what many of you are able to do is you are able to decode the text. You are able to decode the script. But because most of you don't know the language, you will not be able to read it. 
and we can't access the information in the text. Okay. I'll ask the question again. Uh, and Suhani, can you uh, switch on the poll for this one? So how many of you can read this sentence? Okay. Uh, Suhani, could you also let me know once about 10, 15 people have submitted? So that... About 30 people have filled in. We can wait for okay. more responses. Yeah. Okay. So can yeah. you... Thanks to all the 30. The... We'd love if everyone else can also fill in. Okay. Go ahead, okay. Mitali. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So in maybe 10 seconds, you can share the result. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So 83% of people have said yes. So then can you, uh, can one of those 83% tell me what this means? So what is the meaning that you have constructed out of this? Can I have a volunteer? Okay. Or or use the chat. Chat is also great. Okay. Ahana says, is this some code language? Yes and no. Okay. I think it's probably like... Okay. So some people think this is some sort of a code language. And some people who actually... So can I ask Sharon or Natasha to uh, tell me what this sentence actually means? Uh, probably the names of horses in a race. Correct. Foxy Lady and Black Diamond. Correct. Foxy yeah, Lady and Black Diamond are horses. So the sentence means Foxy Lady has an edge over Black Diamond. Foxy Lady is more likely to win than Black Diamond. So now why were they able to read the text and a lot of us were not? Because they had some prior knowledge. I assume that you have some prior knowledge of tracing. So, whether or not you are able to make meaning out of the text depends on how, how much prior knowledge you actually have. So, the previous text we couldn't read because we couldn't access the information in the text. This text, a few of us couldn't read because we didn't have the relevant prior knowledge. A lot of us have not read anything or have not seen anything related to races. So therefore we can't read it. So whether or not I can access the meaning depends on whether or not I can access the information in the text, whether or not I have prior knowledge. There is another component which plays a very important part in reading. So can you read the following text? Can someone tell me what this text means? I can't see anything. Yeah, yeah. There is a word. Oh, there is a word. Oh, his. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. His. Referring to a male person. Okay. Okay, now uh, Amina, now can you tell me what this text means? Uh, it's on a door, so it's like the door is the man's or usually it's on washroom side. Correct, correct. Yeah. So, so the way you made sense of the text depended upon the situation in which you are doing the reading. Correct? Ki context kya tha mera read karne ka? That plays a role in making meaning out of the text. So, we saw three. We need to access the information in the text. We need to have prior knowledge and we need to be aware of the context in which the reading is taking place. 
I will just give you another example of this. Okay. So, can you read the following text? Please take a minute and read the text. Okay. So, uh, I'm assuming most people say that they can read the text. Uh, Suhani, can you switch on the second poll? Uh, Suhani? Oh, yeah, thank you. So, what do you think? Do you think this is a complete text or do you think they are a set of individual sentences thrown together? Or this is a single coherent text where there is one story flowing through the entire passage. Or you can't say. Take a minute and answer the poll. Okay. Uh, Suhani, can I ask you? Okay. So, a uh, lot of people have said that it's individual disconnected sentences. Okay. Now, I will just do this. Now read. So, 77% said that it was individual disconnected sentences. Now, Suhani, can I ask you to switch on poll 3? Now, what do you think? So, now I have added the title, While Flying a Kite. Newspaper is better than a magazine. A seashore is better place than the street. At first, it is better to run than to walk. Even young children can enjoy it. Once successful, complications are minimal. Birds seldom get too close. Rain, however, soaks it very fast. A rock will serve as an anchor. Okay. Uh, yeah, now 97% people think that this is a single coherent passage. So what changed? Can I have an answer? Like, why do you think now that you're able to make meaning out of it better? Context. You gave us the context. Exactly. The context changed. So having the context... Reading is a process of constructing meaning through accessing the information in text by building the prior knowledge and having a context of reading. So now, while we are teaching reading to children, this is the definition that we need to have in mind so that we can systematically focus on all three information in text prior knowledge and context of reading so that if we want to get children to make meaning out of the text, this is the sort of a theoretical orientation the teachers need to have so that they can focus on individual uh, pillars and they can integrate them while constructing meaning. This is the process that we need to do with children and not just uh, make them capable of accessing the information in the text. The context of reading and the prior knowledge also becomes very uh, important while teaching. So now this is what I meant when I said that you need to have a theoretical orientation about certain concepts. 
first we saw that you need to have content knowledge. Secondly, when I when it comes to things like reading, you have the content knowledge. Most teachers can read. That is not an issue. But you need to have some theoretical orientation of what reading actually is, so that I know what to do when I need to teach my children of uh, how to read. Now, what we are not going to do today is we are not going to talk about pedagogic knowledge or peer practice. But what those two things essentially mean is having content knowledge and theoretical orientation is not enough. Another thing that we need to do is we need to focus on the actual instruction in class and the step-by-step -step strategies that we need to use with children while we are teaching. But this... Uh, through this, I just wanted to give you an idea of what a good teacher, what should be the components of a good teacher training program. Uh, okay, so with that, I will stop my presentation. And if you have any questions or comments. Thanks, Natali. I think this was really helpful. Um, but is there is it possible to run over the cons uh, the examples of pedagogic knowledge and peer practice if you think uh, um, no no so see no. this is anyway it was a uh jhalak thi hai. okay what content knowledge <laughs> what building content knowledge means what building theoretical orientation okay. Means. it's okay so uh we could explore awesome. it in detail later so Okay, great. And I think uh, uh, anyone who's interested to know more can obviously reach out to Mitali. I think we're in a great place to just open up for Q&A. Thanks, Mandar. I'm sure we can do it, Mitali, if uh, you have the time to come on board for a second part. But we'll open up for questions. If you have any more, uh, if something didn't get clarified, if you want to ask how this looks like in uh, uh, in practice, please feel free to unmute yourself or put something in the chat and we will. Yes, Ranjana, go ahead. Uh Thank you for this uh, lovely introduction as to where we are lacking. Um, so I would like to ask if our school would like to host and uh, have our, our teachers trained on something like this. Because right now, uh, it is a big blind spot. Uh, teachers are not ready to admit that they lack in anything for that matter. Um, I think that is mainly the reason why we are not able to make progress in terms of changing the way we teach because uh, those who have been experienced experienced mm. teachers over the years mm. so they think that uh, they've been teaching a certain way and it's working for them and mm -hmm. there is something wrong with it the way the children you know their background or their mm -hmm. willingness so they're attributing student failure a lot to all of these factors. Mm -hmm. So uh, being in the position of being a coordinator in my school, mm -hmm. I feel that when I have to address these issues with my experienced teachers, especially, they mm -hmm. feel that we are doing everything right. So if we bring in uh, someone like you with your kind of research mm -hmm. and you put this in perspective, uh, so it will give them clarity as to where to head from there because this is their blind spot right now. They don't even know where they are going wrong in terms of teaching language. So uh, can we invite you on board for this? Is there a cost involved? What is it like? If you can Maybe just... we can talk later. I'm sure uh, we, we can talk one-on-one -on -one and we would love to explore this, uh, this, this sort of an idea. But I will also pick up for the general audience. I will pick up on a word that you used in your mm -hmm. comment, which was blind spot hair. I... I one of our beliefs is that ki, there are very few people when they see that they're doing something wrong, they still don't want to change. Matlab, all of the things that I'm talking about can be changed without, let's say, elongating your hours of instruction. Nahi karna padta. You can teach well in the time that you have. You can teach well with the efforts that you do. Blind spot hai. You are absolutely right. They don't know that this is something that is there that is shown through research that this is this is contemporary knowledge in teacher education most of our teacher education colleges also teach in a very traditional outdated way so uh yeah teachers can be taught and maybe we can have a private conversation later sure thank you 
Thanks for that, Ranjana. Thanks for that, Mithali. I've just put your email ID in the chat also for anyone who wants to reach out and just explore a few more ways that uh, Quest's training can be incorporated. Sherin, go ahead. Hi, Mithali. May I say something to Ranjana? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah uh, Ranjana, hi. Um, I have come across similar things uh, in my practice as a teacher as well. So what I have tried to do is, uh, like Mithali was saying, most people, when they know what's the right thing to do, they want to do the right thing. So even if you are faced with people who initially are reluctant, I think what we can try to do is be uh, take a few classes where we have power, where we have time, where we can experiment. Because some teachers will be willing. who are on board. So in certain of those classes, we experiment. We do the right thing. And we invite uh, senior members to drop in and watch. And it takes time and patience. But after a while, most people come on board. Because everyone... At the heart of it, they want to do a good job. Most people, huh? not everyone. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks for that. Uh, Ambika, go ahead. Hello. Thank you, Mitali. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, my question is about your experience working with so many teachers. Um, have you? Do you find a difference in the the outcomes, the learning outcomes, when you approach it by doing, um, let's say intensive in-person training, say for a week or uh, you know, several months versus um, doing online training as the teachers are teaching over yeah. a longer period of time and check-in. Uh, uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, in-person is always better, I agree. Uh, but even in person doesn't. So I we could talk about this for a long time, but just some few quick thoughts. In person does help, but smaller trainings at frequent intervals help more. Is what we have found, uh, rather than having everything at one go. What we've also found was if uh, online is not completely bad, but it is bad as a beginning. So if we have a couple of introductory workshops or whatever teachers, if you're running a year-long course, having some uh, in-person workshops where you can create a sort of buying in, what I've experienced is buying in cannot be created online. That is very difficult. Uh, but if you can create a buying in offline, some sort of a mentorship and a non-field support can actually be done effectively in a mixed mode kind of a way. So we've actually tried things like uh, patch, patch minute care recording, uh, send us five minutes recording of how you're teaching in classrooms and we'll give you feedback. That works, but that only works if it is preceded by some offline instruction is our experience. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, I will also like to address a comment uh, that content knowledge and pedagogical knowledge cannot be completely separated. I will actually argue that all the four components that I'm talking about cannot actually be completely separated. I just separated them so that we can have a clarity of what the framework is. And those are not the things that you need to actually separate while you're doing teacher training. While you're doing teacher training, you can integrate and you should integrate all of them. They're not watertight compartments at all. Thank you for that, Mitali. Um, we can have the representative from Muktangan. If you can unmute yourself, ask yeah. your question, and then Samrik. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. I'm Mayur from Muktangan. Hi, yeah. Mitali. Hi. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Mitali, I was just wondering. There are so many teacher training programs that take place uh, with from different NGOs from government. And I was just studying if there is a global sort of uh, benchmark or standard mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for ensuring that, you know, these are the minimum things that any teacher training program must have or must achieve. Mm -hmm. Like we have learning outcomes or, you know, uh, for our different academic subjects. 
So if there are there are impact assessment agencies who work and evaluate programs mm-hmm. based on OECD framework generally, mm-hmm. and there are different frameworks. If you Google it, you'll find different. Yeah. yeah. Like for example, yeah. national level NCT, NISTA, all mm-hmm. these deep learning programs over there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, based on the grassroots experience of Quest mm-hmm. and you know all the organizations present right now here. Collectively, uh, do you feel that there is a need to come up with, you know, sort of framework or uh, benchmark or standard for uh, effective teacher training program? When we are designing any teacher training program, Mm -hmm. we can look at that framework and, you know, design the teacher training program, ensuring that at least these are the basic elements which are there. Yeah, I am not sure if I can uh, answer that effectively i will not presume to be knowledgeable in that domain much what i will do is i will give you an opinion ki yes there is definitely a need to sort of standardize some processes and uh, change our view of how we think about teacher training but that also depends on sort of uh, so even oecd is in conflict about direct instruction versus uh, inquiry based education and all of these things so i will totally agree with you that we will need some common core standards uh, and for that i think one of the things that we need to do is we need to understand what teacher training actually is and how what is that going to achieve but reg- whether uh, how well can it be standardized across India? How to go about it? It's something that I've not given active thought as of now, so it might not be a good idea to for me to answer. Yeah, but do you think it is worth an attempt? Like you know, all of us collectively try to uh, sort of create something on those lines. I think one of the things that needs to happen before that is uh, we need to document research well. In India, forget about coming up with a common curriculum or a common framework. One of the things that is lacking also is that all the innovations in teacher training, mein, from all the uh, teacher training, mein, jo just classroom practices may have not been documented as well as they should be. So once they are, I am fairly sure that we can uh, think about um, having some sort of a common... I am, I'm not against that. What I'm saying is that for me to confidently say that, a little more work still needs to happen. I think. Thank you so uh, much, Mayur. Um, may I just respond to more? Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think Center has Center on Center is an organization which has their uh, um, Pan India assessment of teachers, and also they have uh, very organized teacher trainings and the uh, recognition of the efforts which teachers are putting in. So that's one organization which can be looked at if you want to train yourself um, and also assess yourself as a teacher because they have every year they have assessments for different subjects. Uh, I tried it myself and uh, I found their, uh, their the, the way they question is uh, quite uh, at par with any international exam. So you can check that. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for that. Samrik, go ahead. Yeah. First first of all, uh, Mitali, thank you so much for this session. And uh, the my, my concern is uh, often we faced a lot of difficulties while working with the community teachers mm-hmm. on building their context, uh, means the content knowledge, content knowledge. Mm-hmm. Content knowledge. So, so can like like I'm taking uh, the example of the fraction actually. Mm-hmm. So what the process you said, uh, we often face that kind of difficulties while talking with uh, while engaging with community teachers on that because uh, we can if we can use real life example for that, uh, like maybe some TLMs or something like that. That that will that can be helpful. And what will be the process of assessing them, like? Mm-hmm. Uh, what will be the procedure or maybe some framework to assess them? Can you guide me on uh, that? So, uh, assessment ke liye to bahut sare uh, tests hai. Uh, we have also developed some tests, but more than that, uh, and can be done. Uh, we can also have a private conversation 
about how to assess but one of my experiences by the way we were almost exclusively i should have mentioned that in the beginning with teachers who have no professional training so aap jisko community teachers keh rahe ho we work with teachers who are i work in palghar we recruit from local area and we train them for about a year uh, training plus on site support wagaira wagaira it is possible to uh, develop the content knowledge their adults uh with the right approach with the right breaking down of concepts it is actually possible to uh, build the content knowledge content knowledge hona hai as a prerequisite nahi hai what i'm saying is as a part of your teacher training program factor that in ki hame content knowledge build karna hai we almost exclusively work with people you are calling as community teachers okay uh, but but the uh, i आप जिस जिस कम्युनिटी टीचर के रेफरेंस दे रहे हो व्हाट इज देयर एजुकेशनल बैकग्राउंड और एट द मोस्ट बीए ओके एंड एंड दे लिव इन विलेज एंड आई एम आल्सो टॉकिंग अबाउट आंगनवाड़ी टीचर्स हु माइट नॉट इवन हैव दैट मच दे माइट बी एट दैट ओके सो ओके वी ऑलमोस्ट वर्क एक्सक्लूसिवली इन रूरल एंड ट्राइबल एरियाज So, so what kind of uh, like uh, process do you follow just just to highlight that yeah so for example maths mein we factor in at least as much time for content knowledge development as we do for uh, pedagogy actual practicing classroom instruction uh, that is with the prerequisite ki you have a teacher trainer who has very good content knowledge and who can deliver it to the other people very well but we do factor in those days and 50 50 tak ho jata hai okay i i'd love to connect with you on that because yeah. that might help me a lot definitely would love to talk with you sure hi mitali i have a question yeah um so you know i have observed that um i mean it is still easier to mm-hmm. uh, to focus on the primary teachers and you know um have those visualization exercises and concept building mm-hmm. exercises with them in terms of connecting the concepts with the daily lives especially mm-hmm. mathematical concepts but uh, you know when it comes to secondary and senior secondary teachers i find that it is really difficult to connect say for example the concepts of trigonometry differentiation calculus and all with mm-hmm. the daily life and you know really help the learners also visualize these concepts uh, on how to implement them in the daily mm-hmm. life so how do we equip the secondary and senior secondary teachers that they are able to connect these concepts with the daily life for the learners yes yeah. so especially in mathematics i am sure uh, we can talk uh, in detail about all of the areas that you have mentioned trigonometry calculus etc yeah. etc all of that is a separate discussion but i will just like to caution you okay so i should probably have mentioned ki i uh, have a degree i have a masters degree in mathematics from the indian institute of science education and research so uh, what we learn there as a part of my degree and now what i have learned while i am uh, reading and practicing about mathematics pedagogy is that it is there are very few areas in mathematics which can't be connected with daily life most of them can be so there is an abstraction which is which which needs to happen but there are very few concepts where the beginning point cannot be daily life even trigonometry so for waves i can i can give you an example of waves ki trigonometry mein waves kaise aate hain calculus to has a lot of applications or finance so we can start with those examples and then build the formulas and the theorems and there is actually quite good international research also to support that okay because you know the other day i was interacting with eleventh uh, grade physics teacher, and uh, she was struggling with the same thing that you know, um, it is easy to teach the concepts of physics to children, 
and connect them with daily life. But when it comes to solving the numericals, uh, all the children lose their interest who don't have an interest in math too because yeah. you know it's hard to um follow the 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 methodology of you know picture using the pictures and the mm-hmm. Uh, and the manipulatives that we use in math to, I mean, primary math to drive the home, drive home the concepts. Uh, as we go senior, uh, the math and the physics and all the numericals and all go more abstract in nature. And that's when, you know, even children start losing their interest into, you know, forming the daily life connections with these concepts. Yeah. Yeah. So some so, of it is true. Uh, manipulatives to it many use kar sakoge, but manipulatives are also not extremely essential after a certain age. They sometimes help, but sometimes just you you can you you have imagination that is uh enough. Uh I will agree with you that it becomes difficult uh to conceptualize real life situations, but it is it is very much doable and lots of people have uh, done research on how to actually connect the real life examples with the concepts taught in classrooms. One of the problems that we also have in our uh, idea of professional development is that not reading original research is something that most educators do. They don't read original research. They don't read, uh, they don't keep up with the knowledge that is uh, being generated across the globe. So it is. So where can they access, you know, this re- this kind of a research, and like use it for for their own professional development also? Because most of the teachers, I'm sure, are not even aware that you know this kind of a research is available and where to yeah. access it from. And, and it's in English, uh, which also might be a problem for a lot of teachers. I I understand be. that. Yeah, could be. Yeah. So then, how do we solve it for them in terms of you know if there is research available? First of all, we have to you know make them aware that there's yes, this kind of research is available and this so, is how they can especially for them. mathematics. I will give you a resource. It's called Essential Understanding of Mathematics. It's a good resource. We use that all the time. It's accessible to teachers. I will type that in chat. Yeah. Is it a book or, or is it a, a it's a set of books? One book about one concept like algebra. Okay, and it's available on Amazon, is what I'm saying. I don't know. I already have the hard copies given to me by someone, uh, but uh, I assume it's it's not a rare book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we could start with uh, such things. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, Mitali. I think we'll take one or two more final questions or comments, if anyone has. I think Ranjana on chat is asking if there are any yeah. resources you uh, can suggest so, for English comprehension. Yeah. I, Go ahead. The, the resource for English comprehension is just not coming to mind right now. I am blanking out, but I will be able to find that out later. Awesome, Ranjana, you can nail Mitali and hopefully she would yeah. remember. I think there's a question on chat from Isha about uh, how do you how share insights on teaching social sciences in the training? What does that look like? Yeah, and I'm then not, we can go to... I am not uh, very comfortable with social sciences. Okay. So I won't presume to answer that. Language and mathematics is still okay because uh, that is something we've done a lot. Awesome, no worries. Uh, Sharon, go ahead. I had a resource that could probably be useful for English. It's an excellent resource called Literature and the Child by uh, Bernice Kalinin and D. Galda. So it has, it's a, seed, it's a set of two books. So could be useful like uh, the essential understanding of mathematics that Mitali shared. Uh, excellent, simply explained text, uh, clear examples given from specific children's literature, both fiction and non-fiction and a very extensive bibliography. Mm -hmm. So it's been published some years back. Uh, I can also put it in the chat. Very, very good book. Thank you. Uh, Amina, can I ask one more question? Go ahead, Mayur. Yeah. So, uh, Nitali, uh, we, uh, we focus on active constructive learning a lot. 
uh, in primary grade, grades of mathematics. But often uh, we face difficulties in convincing teachers that you can still use it as a method uh, for higher grades. Like, yeah. You know, but there is a always uh, this thing between exam and uh, using right methodology because mm -hmm. during ninth and tenth people are mostly exam oriented. You know, they are preparing for board exams, for example. So, do you think that this active constructive or you know uh, this kind of approach is feasible uh, for higher grades? You mentioned yeah. that you know we yeah, yeah. still connect to the daily lives. Yeah, yeah. But as a just pedagogic just approach, that. yeah, 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 it it is. And uh, I also know a lot of schools who do that. Uh, what I will not presume to do is I I don't know the exact situation in which you operate. What we have generally found useful, just as a tip, is uh, start building from the ground up. So if your primary teachers are convinced, if they start seeing results, if your secondary teachers are convinced, a little later, your 9th and 10th and 11th and 12th grade teachers are also going to be convinced. Uh, it is okay if they change later than your primary teachers. So first show the results and then uh, start expecting change from the uh, critical change makers like your 9th, 10th, 11th and 12th standard teachers. But th th this is just a, this is just a, this is just off the top of my head. I am thinking out loud. Yeah. Maybe we can connect on this later. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. I think I'm seeing a few chat, a uh, few uh, notes on the chat about the books and the resources. I think we can close with Isha's question around how can one keep up with any latest pedagogical developments? And uh, I think we can just close with that, Mithali. Yeah, uh, actually, I don't even have a good answer for that. And I understand that I'm saying this a lot. But one of the ways that we keep up with the latest pedagogical development is follow authors and read original literature. Just do a Google search every once in a while. That is what I do. Uh, so I have a list of uh, subjects or topics or areas that I want to cover when it comes to pedagogy. So right now, I am uh into statistics education a lot or i am into some explicit so uh let, let's say statistics education so what i will do is i will google use google scholar i will search for original literature generally just ka title so much just abstract so much those are the papers that you want to read that is the process that has worked for us it, it is it is a long one it is not a easy answer but that is what we do Thank you so much for that, Mitali. I think you're incredibly humble, but you've really shed light on so many things. And I think it was so engaging to go over the, um, just go over the process with you and see those things in smaller chunks. Thank you to everyone who engaged as well. I think we'll just close with Suhani putting in the feedback form again for uh, on the chat. Okay, on cue. Uh, it would be great if you can all fill this out and really tell us about how you, uh, how how the session was, what you can do better. And Mitali, to you, I think thank you so much for doing this, uh, for being so detailed. And hopefully we'll have you for a part two because it's public demand. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time and thank you so much, everyone else have a great rest of the evening yeah. thank you so much it was lovely being here okay